Welcome to all of our guests. Thanks for um, coming and being brave enough to tell your story. Um, and also thanks to our audience for joining in. We're here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, so as Dennis said, today we'll be discussing the Civil War from a survivor's perspective. Uh, it's very important for us to share our stories and to know our history. Um, one reason is that we have to know where we're coming from in order to know where we're going. Um, taking the time to remember this history also, also should be a measure in us ensuring that we don't repeat um, these terrible events all over again. And it's also just a way of therapy. It's therapeutic to share your story. I know for many of the survivors of this uncivil war, um, they've never shared their stories and it's been bottled up for years. Uh, but I, I think it is well past time for us to have our healing. And so I hope this helps in the healing process and also is just an educational moment for all of us. Um, so yes, thanks for being here. Um, Mr. Mr. Cooney, uh, to start, uh, in, in 1989, when things began to get shaky in uh, Liberia, where were you? Well, um, Mr. Dennis and uh, the staff at a focus on Liberia, I want to take this time to so thank you very much and for the privilege accorded me to be on this platform uh, to present my own survival story uh, during the Liberian Civil War. Uh, in doing so, please uh, permit me to, to share a minute to remember my daughter, Shara Kanekuni who was exactly three and a half years old when the Civil War started. She passed away at the age of four uh, during the war, uh, given the accomplishment of her siblings that came after her. I got no doubt that with the grace of God, Shara, who has been about 33 years old today, who has been a very fantastic young lady, she will have been accomplished young lady. Uh, she will have been married. And who knows, I would have been a granddaddy a little earlier. So I want to honor her and honor the hundreds of thousands of other Liberians that perished in our senseless civil war. Uh, with regard to your question, uh, December, where I was, when the announcement of the incursion was made on Christmas Eve, 1989, I was an instructor at the National Police Training Academy. I've been a lifelong law enforcement officer uh, who rose through the ranks, served in many middle-level management positions at the Liberian National Police. And I think at about the beginning of 1989, uh, there was a policy decision to augment the instructional quality at the Liberian National Police Training Academy. So we were the, the early recruits that were sent there to, to provide instructional leadership uh, at the academy. So when that announcement was made, I was a captain, a senior instructor uh, at the Labrador National Police Training Academy in Pinsville. Okay. Um, and so as news started to spread about uh, the capture of the president um, and later on torture and death of the president. I guess, how were you receiving that information and what was going through your mind at that time? Well, uh, <clears throat> the story of my survival during the war is a very interesting one. Prior to my deployment at the National Police Training Academy as an instructor, I was the commander of the Criminal Investigation Division 
uh, at the Zone 3 police station in Kona Town. So as part of that responsibility, I was uh, in charge of investigating all level of crimes. And so my survival story actually started in June of 1989. Mm. At that time, the rebel forces were were way out there in Lima County, but then there was almost like a general breakdown of law and order emerging in Monrovia. So an individual that was once in our custody as a criminal had now joined the armed forces of Liberia as part of the general mobilization uh, to, to enable the government to, to fight the rebels. So this guy presented the first real threat to me and my family. Mm -hmm. So I basically started to run for cover in June mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, 1990. And that uh, desire to live took me from Monrovia in June. And I didn't get much farther than Fendel, Fendel campus, uh, 1990. There where I was. Uh, when the war started to advance deeper and deeper into Monrovia. And it was in one of the villages around Fendel, the Bensonville area to be specific, the called Bulu Town, is where I was hiding in deep cover when I heard that uh, President Doe was, was killed by the INTFL forces. So you say you were in deep cover. Were you at like a friend or relative's home or? No, I was not a friend and relative, relative home. Uh, you know, sometimes when uh, people talk about survivors of the war or victims of the war, because the war was fought on, on mostly ethnic, ethnic lines, uh, people tend to believe that it is only uh, the antagonistic tribes that were affected. But the other group of people that were affected in our war were government employees, mm -hmm. especially if you were a member of the, the security forces. You were at greater risk than any other person uh, if you were working with the security, uh, the national security outfit at the time. So, if I say I went into deep cover, I went into a village that I knew nobody, mm. and nobody had no knowledge of me. But to even take extra precaution, I had to change my name. Mm. I had to change my name. Wilma Kuni at that point during the war was known as Joe, just yes, Joe, simple Joe. Because you don't even want to make the mistake of somebody knowing your name. So it was in this little village uh, called Bolo Town, after Bensonville. Uh, that we were, uh, the village, uh, uh, by the time we arrived there, it was a deserted village. The resident of that village may have fled for safety elsewhere, but we met other people there. And, you know, during that time, you don't ask much of a question. You know, you just pray that you stay alive. You know, some of the methods we took, the men in the village would go in the, in the forest during the entire day. Mm. You go into the forest the entire day, stay in the farmhouses, and, and, and return at night. Only to leave 6 a.m. the next day. So it was like a routine mm. um, just, to, just, to, just to keep alive, keep yourself alive. Uh, the interesting story is one of the guys who and I used to go in the forest, mm. the guy was a police officer, but he wouldn't even tell me. You know, but, you know, we were just, well, my man, it's time for us to go. And he was a police officer that is from that town. Mm -hmm. He didn't reveal that to me. So I was following him along. He knew the, the, the environment, the terrain. And, you know, he took care of us from one farmhouse to the other farmhouse. We, where we stayed the whole day. We either looked for farm nuts. We looked for cabbage, farm cabbage and take that home in the middle of the night to our family. So that was the kind of life I, I lived during that period. Yeah, and so if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. 
Uh, we have more survivors that are going to join later on, but right now we are speaking with Mr. Wilmot Coney, who was in the police force at the time the war came. And uh, we are going to be talking more about how he survived and what was his experience like during the war. And Mr. Coney, uh, you, if you're talking, will you sit up a little bit? Maybe we are getting some uh, feedback from your, your line. So back, back to you, Danielle. Yes, so your family was with you in this village? You, you oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my wife. I have, I have my, my in-laws, my two in-laws, two sis, uh, my, two, uh, my wife, two sisters. I have my daughter, Shara. She had not passed at that time. Mm -hmm. And I have my son, Wilma Jr., who, thank God, by the grace of God, survived the war. He's now 29 years old and live in Philadelphia. Wilma was six months old then. Mm -hmm. He was six months old during that war. And so the struggle was not only for you to survive, but for all, also for your family to survive. And, and that, was a, that was a real balancing act because the time spent in the bush was used to cutting palm nuts, digging old cassava, Cutting palm carries. The palm nuts was brought in town, and my wife and her sisters, they had to exchange that palm nut for a cup of rice. Mm. And that cup of rice had to be divided. We take half of it for Wilmot Jr., and the other half is what the, the, the five of us, you know, we have to eat with a lot of palm carries. So it, it, was, it was a real terrible time, you know, you find people who, who could really, really uh, provide for themselves living below that, 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 that kind of level of poverty. And, and then in addition to that, you have all of the insecurity around you. Uh, and, and so these are some of the lessons that we learned. And Unfortunately, it looked like those who came after us that didn't experience these kind of situations, they think that, you know, uh, violence and other things like that, they think that, I mean, they, those are not things to actually play with. I hope and pray that our country will never, never, ever return to that situation where uh, you, you smell killing all around you, uh, where you cannot even... Uh, provide for your family, malnutrition all around you, and uh, you, you, there is that feeling of, of general hopelessness and uh, bewilderment. People don't know where to go. The village mm. is taking shelter. People who live in that village, they left the village for other places of shelter, and you know that circle of violence, uh, violence around you. Mm. So that, that, was, that was the kind of the environment that existed at that time. So, Mr. Mr. Kuni, uh, yeah. you were a police officer and teaching at the police academy. And right. uh, why would a policeman be in hiding? Why were you a target? And, and second to that, walk me through your experience from your home to the time you arrived in that village. What happened? Well, the, you know, when the war started, there was this... Uh, uh, all of these propaganda coming from beyond the MPFL line that uh, the MPFL was only coming to, to, to overthrow the dictatorship, breaking peace and democracy. And uh, in fact, people should go beyond the lines where there was more safety and more security. But most of that, as I said earlier, I started my own run survival run with my with the government of the day own forces. So that landed me in Fendel. When I got to Fendel, I realized that security officers and employees of the government were a, a serious target for the MPFL. In fact, on one of the daily routine of trying to, to find food for the family, it was when I was identified by a young girl who had relative working at the police academy. She used to visit the academy uh, before the war. 
And this girl was now a member of the of the MPFL. She was one of the female commandos of the MPFL. And she was the one that identified me at one of the checkpoints uh, to those guys. And the way she introduced me, <laughs> this man, I wanted to stop policemen for do that do police strategy. Wow. I was, <laughs> it's how I was introduced. And so, of course, I denied that because even without admitting the gun was already pointing at my neck. So, I, you know, I did the best I could to, to say that um, I was not in the police force, but for each statement I made, the girl was there to count out the statement. I know this man. This man is a trained police officer. He's trained in this information. He's trying to disinform you. And she was there. So, by the grace of God, a, a, a lady that I went to high school with, uh, Mercy, her name was Mercy Walker. I didn't even know that she was from Lima County because, you know, before the war, we never really had time for, you know, those kind of things. You know, Mercy, I just, you know, her name was Mercy Walker. Uh, Mercy saw me at a checkpoint. It was Mercy who intervened with uh, the Special Forces Commander and try to, to at least support me in my story that, you know, I was not a police officer. I was a student at the University of Liberia. And then we started giving all of the, the possible stories that, you know, would make the guy to believe us. And Mercy and that guy talked for almost one hour. Mm. And, you know, sometimes you begin to believe that if it is not your day, not your day. Because some people were just grabbing instantly killed, and I was there for about one hour. Somebody intervening on my behalf, pleading for me. And you know, he was patient enough. At the end of the day, he looked at me and said, You know what? My sister confirmed to me that uh, you are not a police officer. So I'm going to give you a pass. You know, he had a pen and a paper in his hand. But where will he write the pass? So he asked me to bend down. My back down was the table. He started writing. <laughs> he wrote the note on. He wrote the note on my back and signed it. And by him signing it, I remember his name up to this day. The name is Special Forces Pin Takawa. And then he asked me and said, "Well, anytime anybody stop you, give them this that uh, that I've already investigated you." But, I mean, you would be totally naive to take that pass and take it for anything. Because this was not an organized group of people. Anybody could see that thing and tear it from you. So it was at that point that we made the decision that, look, we cannot stay here in Fender because we got to be going around looking for food. I don't know when the next special forces is going to encounter me. And... This girl was still on the campus. I don't know when I was going to meet her again and we're home. So we took the decision to leave and there and with nowhere to go, just going. And then some people would tell you that, oh, no, yeah, let's go to this place. Yeah, let's go to that place. Uh, we were, I think the intention we started was to go to Bento. We to go to Bento. But the, the people that were leading us to Bento because of the different, different checkpoints, we got we got uh, disconnected from them. That's how we ended in a village outside Benta, the called Bolo Town. And you know, that village saved my life. I intend to go and visit that place the next time I'm in Liberia, because that was my only my my, my the refuge place for me and my and my family. How long were you in that village? I was in that village. We landed in that village in July. In July of 1990, we, we remained in that village until, I think, October. October of 1990, we, we remained in that village when we heard the news that uh, uh, President Doe was killed. We were in that village when we had our Echo Mocha arrive. Uh, so the next plan was how to find our way to to the, to the peacekeepers' line, I had to find our way back to Monrovia. But even though the peacekeepers were in Monrovia, uh, Bensonville, 
Pendel, all of those areas were still under the, the control of the MPFL. So then, uh, where, so where were you able to make it from the village that you said October? So we were still in the village in October, and then uh, the forces of the IMPFL arrived. Uh, Prince John, Prince John forces arrived uh, and liberated Fendel and liberated uh, Bento and the surrounding villages. But then the uh, the the atmosphere was different with the Prince Johnson forces because the frontline troops that arrived among that frontline troops were few guys recognized me, few uh, fighters of the IMPFL that were in different law enforcement outfit before the war. They, they were in the you know there were people that we at that time the police academy. They are, they, I mean, we train, who we are responsible to train all law enforcement officers in Liberia. Mm -hmm. So from the Free Zone Authority, from LAMCO, Land Protection, and there were times we even trained elements of the, uh, the military intelligence, G2. Mm -hmm. So it, as an instructor, you know, a lot of law enforcement officers know me. So it was strange when the Prince Johnson forces arrived, two of the guys that you know, they claimed to know me from the, you know, from the police academy. They were the first that were on the front line. And when they saw me, you know, I mean, I was severely hungry. I was thin. I lost a lot of weight. But they were still able to recognize me. And they saluted. You know, they said, oh, Captain Coney, they record, you know, they called me by my name. They saluted. I was, you know, I was shaking, you know. Because the experience with the MPFL, I thought it was a widespread stuff in the entire rebel movement. But these guys from the Prince Johnson side, they saw me, uh, gave me the necessary courtesy. And they said, oh, but why are you doing here? I said, oh, you know, I'm here. I'm caught up in a war. And then they said, okay, we'll go on an offensive. We will complete the offensive. We'll take you and your friends to, we'll take you and your family to, to, the, to the base in Carwell. But being the security man I am, I was highly skeptical. Mm -hmm. Immediately they left, I went into another layer of underground so they can't find me. Because I don't know what their base looked like, who owned their base, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So when they left, you know, my family and I, we decided to change location. You know, because I don't know why they waited me. I don't know the military structure and... But even though the current said now was standing, I was I was completely suspicious of the activities. So we changed location, and we were at that location for for about two two or three days, and then we got word from the street that it was now safe to 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 return to Monrovia. So we started walking, mm -hmm. we walked from Central City to Monrovia. You know, so that that's how we got back to Monrovia. How long did that walk take? Oh, that, it's a whole day walk, whole day, you know, checkpoints. Uh, in fact, at one point, at one point, I got, uh, I got disconnected from the, from the family, my wife, my children. They were all ahead of me. And I was at uh, another location. So by the time I could catch up with them, they had already crossed a checkpoint. And it was curfew time, so I had to stay at that checkpoint overnight. Mm -hmm. That was one of the longest, longest nights for me. I was at that checkpoint, and these guys were discussing their battle plan, how they're going to do this, what they're going to do when they get to Kakata. And I was at the checkpoint. I couldn't cross the checkpoint because it was curfew time. So they told me, they said, well, the, the soldiers told me that I, I can only cross the checkpoint during the daylight. So that night... I slept at the military bar at, at their checkpoint. All kinds of stuff coming through my mind. Whether there will be a counter attack from MPFL from them. I mean, what reason will I give if they catch me to the checkpoint? You know, I will, you know, they could easily take me to be one of their soldiers. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, I remained there until they broke. 
And then the, the guy, the commander at the checkpoint, he said, well, uh, wait, we are mobilizing troops to go to Kakata. And say one General Rambo was the one that was leading the troop. If the Rambo uh, uh, units passed, then he will allow me to cross the checkpoint. So after mm. that, when I crossed it, when I crossed the checkpoint, my family went, you know, the first house I passed by, I passed by the first house. The second house is where my family were waiting for me. And again, that's another, that's another memorable moment for me because it was my daughter, uh, Cheryl, the one who passed away. She was the first one that supported me. Mm-hmm. You know, I almost four years, she supported me. And she ran to me, Daddy, Daddy. But she recognized me and she ran to me. And, you know, elected everybody that, you know, I was around. And so the entire family got together and then we started the journey to Monrovia. Hmm. So sorry and hard wrenching. Mr. Kony, you, you said uh, N- I and Pierre liberated the place. That's a key word, liberated. What does that mean that you are liberating it from NPFL? Well, we, I mean, yeah, that was the that was the the, the 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 words they were using, and at the same time, too, I mean, comparing them to the MPFL, uh, they were not only. I mean, their actions, you know, in the areas that they captured, supported, you know, something like liberation, because after they captured the place, you commands were going out. Oh, we can't we can't do nothing to the civilians. In fact, we were saying we need the civilians to vote. So the article Prince Johnson said we should not kill the civilians because they got to vote. Uh, and then they had this gun that there was this big theory about Prince, the gun that liberate, should not rule, you know, all these things. So to be honest with you, the area where I was, and I tell people, because of the extreme measure I had to take to survive myself, and the areas I was, I, I did not see anybody killing anybody during the war, to be honest. I didn't see anybody came in, anybody. The first military violence that I was caught up in was when French forces came and liberated uh, the place where we were. They did not kill anybody. They evacuated the people. And, you know, and even when I got to Monrovia, I was surprised. When I got to Monrovia, I saw a, a, a colleague of mine who was in the security force. You know, I said, I said, Mama, how are you walking around here freely? He said, no, all you got to do is to go to cutting tree and report yourself. And the people give you a pass, they don't bother us yet. And it was kind of different coming from the MPFL territory, where the instant recognition that you were a government person, especially a, a security person, met, you know, instant death. Mm-hmm. So taking taking you back to the beginning, Mr. Kuni, um, and uh, met up with your family. You then made it to Monrovia that day. Yeah. After we, after I crossed the checkpoint, my family was just about two houses away from that checkpoint. Mm-hmm. And then we started walking to Monrovia, passing through all the little settlements. I think uh, Harrisburg, you know, Louisiana, all those settlements. Using those settlements for. Getting somewhere around Carway, but bypassing the Prince Johnson Bridge at the Prince Johnson Base. And then I have come. And my wife family, you know, my wife is from Logan Town, so her family was right there in Logan Town. Mm-hmm. So we, we, you know, we, we, we reunited with our, our family in Logan Town, and it was a welcome relief. Uh, at least we were in the areas controlled by the peacekeepers, even though the IMPFL. You know, we're still there. Mm-hmm. And then it didn't take long. Uh, uh, the interim government arrived. And uh, we had the opportunity to serve the interim government. Too. And, and that's exactly what I was coming to. This, uh, your experience was, uh, this was still 1990. The war, that right. was just the beginning of the Labyrinth right. Civil War. What happened right. in the other successive war? What were your experiences uh, since like? Well, to be honest with you, Brother Dennis, uh, given what I went through, given what I went through for just being as 
uh, ordinary law enforcement officer, when we landed to Monrovia, my, I made a decision with my family that I was never going to return to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. That nothing was going to persuade me to, to return to law enforcement, especially uh, given all of the harassment and everything. I needed to do something different. So we were in, we were in looking town, trying to live civilian life, working with the special emergency life food program and all of these uh, civilian things that were going around. When uh, I think I was walking on uh, walking on Jamaica Road. And I came across a police car. At that time, now you know the Indian government was constituted in Monrovia. I came across uh, a police guy and he said, Well, the director of police was looking for me. I said, Why would the director of police look for me? He said, No, they're looking for they're looking for staff at the police academy. You know, so I think it would be good if you go to to Central, you know, that's how we call the police headquarters in Liberia. If you go to Central. And, uh, and me with the director of police. I resisted that, but after that, another emissary came and said, look, the director wanted to see me. So then I went to the police station. What was happening there now, uh, the American security friend, Intercom, I arrived in Liberia. And they had this contract with the United States Embassy. And Intercom was interested in meeting some requirement of training for their guys. And only the police academy could do that. So I think this is why this urgent appeal, you know, was, was uh, they sent this urgent appeal to not specifically look for me, but to look for any instructor from the police academy who was around. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a specific instruct, you know, instruction for me. It was like, where can we, I mean, is there a staff of the, of the police academy that is around? So when I went there, uh, they called the, the management team of the security company. And uh, I told director Yomi at the time, the lady Yomi, I told Yomi that I, I didn't want to do law enforcement anymore. He said, why, you know? And then we went through all of this. He said, but look, we have our partners here. They have to meet setting. Uh, requirements, and then uh, you are the only one here, so you can you can train them, you know, and then whatever you want to do, you know, that's something for us to discuss in the future. So those guys, they took me immediately to their offices, the Mama Point, and we had a discussion, and the guy asked me, the guy said, look, we, we I mean, we are ready to employ you right now. Even we don't care what you and the police do, but we want to employ you. So then I got employed by the Intercom Security as a training coordinator. So there where I was, you know, training their guys. And later on, I discovered another colleague of mine, Major Samuel Khan, who then was assisting me. And then uh, we were training the, the Intercom Security group, about 400 guys, you know, we're training them from time to time. So that was the civilian life I thought. I was beginning to live in Liberia mm -hmm. until, you know, we started getting calls from the interim government for other assignments. And so what happened at that point when they called you? Oh, yeah, well, after that, uh, when the interim government came, they also needed to, to restructure the, uh, the security apparatus. And so the... I was invited uh, to play a role at the National Security Agency. Uh, so I was appointed by the Indian government as uh, the Deputy Director of Administration at, at NSA. Mm -hmm. And then there where we, we became part of the security structure uh, in Monrovia. You know, at that time now, Monrovia had almost like one million, mm -hmm. one million people. Almost everybody in Liberia was coming to Monrovia for safety because it was the only point of safety. Even 
people from the MPFL side, you know, they would always come to Mongolia. So Mongolia was, I mean, the security needs of Mongolia was huge. And so we had to play our role as citizens to make sure first that the population was safe. And uh, in that modest way, we started contributing to, uh, to, to the peace process, security, uh, security concerns uh, uh, for the peace process. We started making recommendations, uh, things that would lead the country back to peace. So, so Mr. Kuni, at, during that time, there was uh, the octopus of 92. There was the uh, April, April 6th War of 1996. And also, and later on, 2003. Where were you at that time? At those different points in time, and were you still a target? Well, uh, in during the other fall, yes, I was still a target number for different. I mean, uh, in 1992, now I was a target for the MPFL because now I was, uh, uh, I they call it, a high-level security official for the interim government. So. That made me a prime target for the MPFL. Uh, me and other security officials that were in Monrovia were the prime target for the MPFL. So in Octopus, during Octopus, we were we we were the one designing security strategies, uh, working along with Ecomark uh, for Ecomark to, to 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 confront the MPFL and to ensure that Monrovia was safe. So uh, we were not really uh, popular behind the lines. We were part of their security planning and everything. So that was 1992 during the octopus. After the octopus was repelled, uh, there was no more major attack on Monrovia after the octopus was repelled. The skirmishes were around the were around the boundaries separating the, uh, the NPFL and uh, the, the, the interim government somewhere around uh, Kakata area. Those were, you know, the scrimmages. And then there would be this uh, regular incursion of NPFL operatives into interim government controlled territories. Uh, I know you are familiar with the massacre on Dupo Road. That, uh, that happened during the, the interim government, but those were NPFL operatives that uh, enter the interim government control territories and uh, carry on the massacre in in Dupolo. Uh, there was also the massacre in Kata Camp. You know, those were areas under the interim government control, but there was this consistent uh, MPFL incursion to to carry on all of these uh, unwholesome acts during our time. And so those were the challenges that we were facing. Uh, and just, uh, because you mentioned Duporo, mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a song for Duporo. Tell you to taste the great water come down from the dark African sky. And, and we played that song at the beginning of the uh, of of the show about what's happening in Duporo. Maybe you need to hear it again. How you doing, sir? And if you are watching this broadcast, please call 706-684-0392 to join the discussion. So, Mr. Kuni, let me take you back to the village because I too experienced the war and let me see what your experience was like. Because when you're in a village like that, I mean, clothes, toothpaste, uh, food, and all those things, especially you had a baby, baby food and all that. How did you manage or confront those situations? Well, like I, like I said earlier, my brother, we were six. And uh, we tried to survive on one cup of rice. In fact, the one cup of rice, uh, uh, the way to get that cup of rice is to 
is to daily go into the bush and look for farmland. You have to every day go into the bush to look for palm nuts. And uh, you get the palm nuts, then you have to trade the palm nuts for rice. And then you may be lucky, maybe there, there may be time where you see a little bit stronger and get more palm nuts and probably get like two, three cup of rice. But you know, you're not going to have that luck every day. So mm -hmm. the way we manage is we take that one cup as I indicated, we already had a young baby. And mind you, uh, before I even go to that point, because we all know the war was coming, so we, we bought a lot of food for the baby. Bought a lot of food for the baby. And when we were arrested on Fender, the rebel took the baby food. But the day way, I don't know. They, they charged me for looting. They said, they said we are looted the food. Either I agree that we are looted at the fool or I was a government official. You know, because only in their in their mind, only government official, you know, had the, the means to buy that kind of food that I had. So they seize, they seize the, the my son food. So now we have to go, that one cup of rice we were divided. And since he was the youngest baby, you know, more portion would be for him where I you know. My wife and the sisters, they would beat it. They would beat it and fix it, you know, the way, it, you know, they fix it and, and, and give it to him. And then the other half cup of rice is the one that either will, you know, overwhelm with plant cabbage or with cassava leaf, you know, and then we'll all eat that. Uh, I remember this day I, I went in the bush to go get the, I think it was pan cabbage. Yeah, pan cabbage. My brother and my sister, as I threw the cutlet on that palm tree, my eyes started spinning. The whole forest was spinning in my eye. Mm. So I grabbed that palm tree because I didn't want to fall. When it settled down for a little bit, I simply packed up my bag and went back to town with our pan cabbage. Because if I had dropped in that bush there, where the, where the EMS said that was going to come for me there, mm -hmm. you know, they were all going to with me. So I didn't continue. The nearest little tree that was close to the palm tree, I grabbed it until my eyes settled. But, you know, it, I mean, we, looking back now, you know, these things are easy to talk. But at the time they were happening, you know, I mean, you thinking about your your survival. You thinking about your family. Uh, you got a young baby, you know. And so, these were terrible times. We are terrible mm. times. And 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 then it, it is the reflection of all of these things that hold some of us in restraint in welcoming saviors. You know, in my lifetime, I've welcomed two saviors. Mm. For each time we welcome saviors in our country, our country don't make progress. We go backward. Mm. People die, and then we go backward. We welcome saviors that kill our people. When the saviors arrive, the country, there is no progress. The country go backward. I've not seen the progress that we made when we welcome our first saviors in 1980. I've not seen the progress that we made when we welcome uh, Mr. Charles Taylor as a savior. See where Labrador is. And so some of us are very, very restrained when people are talking about saving us. For me, I prefer we don't kill anybody. If you want to save us, go save us through the ballot box. At least you can get where you want, but nobody dies. But the whole notion of people dying for saviors to arrive, then the country go backward. That's something we got to look at as Liberia. Mm. You know, so that is why we are very, very, very restrained when people are talking about saving us. At least let's agree now that if you want to save us, let's do the ballot box. Maybe your argument can win other people's argument, but at least nobody will die. And maybe mm -hmm. some progress will be made by us using the ballot box. Because some of these things are very horrible. These are, I mean, like I said, because I was in deep cover, I didn't see people dying. But there are 
horrible stories of people that I know that die in very horrible ways. You know, because a savior was coming. A savior who's supposed to give us democracy was coming. A savior who's supposed to eliminate corruption was coming. A savior who's supposed to uh, develop Liberia was coming. So 30 years now, where are we? Where are we with all these promises? So don't we have the right to ask that when somebody promises us the next time, we got to first of all know the nature of the promise and know who making the promise and look at the track record of that person to see that person, whether, he, whether that person even get the credibility to make the promise. Are you telling me that because I'm a Christian, so anybody that says Christ Christ that the person I'm going to go and follow? These are the questions. And these are the questions that you ask, you know? Mr. Cooney, we have, we have yeah, a question ahead. from Facebook from George Toto. He said, based upon your experience, do you recommend yeah. for war crimes court in Liberia? Well, uh, I believe in the perpetrators, those who perpetrated crimes against, war crimes against the Liberian people to be held accountable. I've stated that uh, publicly, even when I, when I was president of the Union of Liberian Association, we stated that publicly. Uh, and I still do believe that, that there should, I mean, people should be, the whole idea of people who committed these heinous crimes, walking down uh, the corridors of power is something that, you know, that incensed me, you know. But we have to find a way to do that because the establishment of the war crime code is not just a slogan. It should not be a slogan, you know. There are real, there are real practical issues that is associated with that. I was completely disappointed when... Uh, in the last 12 years, giving all of the international attention the country had, giving all the international assistance the country had, that we could not move our war crime tribunal. We had a, the, the, the presence of the United Nations in Liberia, more than 15,000 UN troops, more than 4,000 police officers. The, the state, the apparatus, the security apparatus was prior. The international support to the country was fine. That was the right time if the code was to be established, for that code to be established. But now see where the country is in terms of security. For the first time in the last 30 years, the country is, de is depending on its own effort to maintain security. So in as much as I want the war crime code, I worry about the practicality of establishing it at this time. Are mm -hmm. our system firm enough to carry on such an endeavor? And you bear with me. Uh, just a few days ago, see how alarmed the country was just by a few former generals making a radio declaration. The entire country was alarmed. Is somebody telling me now that we have the capacity we have the ability to go after uh, people who committed these acts at this time in our country history. I don't think so. And the fact that I don't think so at this time doesn't mean that I don't believe that they should be held accountable. So those are two different things. I don't think we have, our, we, our system is, is firm enough in the midst of all the other issues that we're facing today for us to add war crime court. Where is the means? Who's going to, who's going to provide for the court? Who, who, who want to, you know, who want to fund the court? There are other things that we have to pay attention to right now. So yes, I believe that perpetrators of war crime need to be held accountable. I just don't believe that we have the capacity and the ability to do it at this time. I think uh, uh, we need other things need to fall into place uh, before we can go that level. We missed that opportunity in the last 12 years. You know, I got one. I have one of my old old teacher in fourth grade. I used to tell me 
that opportunity once lost cannot be easily regained. And sometimes these things apply to some of the things in Liberia. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Cooney, at, at what point did you leave Liberia? Well, uh, I left Liberia uh 1995 when the uh i think the tenure the indian government and the tenure in 1994. so at that point they had a series of uh warring faction indian government you know so uh i i didn't take particular interest in warring faction i've never worked for warring faction before in my whole life, I've always worked for the constituted government of Liberia. So when the, the governance of the of the country started slipping into, you know, warring faction uh, arrangement, where this faction bring this, that faction bring that, uh, it was uh, it was the time I left. Uh, I left the government, and then uh, eventually I left the country. So. I was not in the country during the April 1996 war. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever I hear, uh, I know about that war was information that was really to me. So how were you able to make it out of the country? Oh, no, I mean, I left Liberia uh, uh, normally because during the infant government time, you know, I mean, there were flights. Mm -hmm. uh, like living out of Liberia, I didn't, I didn't hide. You know, the, 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 the peacekeepers were still in charge of security in Monrovia. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the interesting thing, there was an attempt for my own agency to arrest me at the airport. Uh, because according to them, uh, there was something I was running away. And so I don't know why they were really trying to stop me. Uh, but the ECOMOC uh, forces intervened, and uh, I was allowed to continue my, my journey out of Liberia. And so you went from Liberia directly to America? Well, I flew to, from Liberia, I flew to Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. uh, Cote d'Ivoire, so uh, at that time, they had this airline called AfriLink. No, it's not AfriLink. You know, I forgot it. Air Africa, mm. and then took, uh, came to came to the United States, and so I've been here since that time. I've visited Liberia occasionally, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this 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 is my story. And so it, it seems for a lot of Liberians, we didn't get much rehabilitation after the war or any therapy or anything like that. When you arrived in America, how were you able to deal with what you had left behind? Well, the first thing is, is, is family responsibility. So I left uh, half of my family behind. I was the only one that was here. Okay. So when I arrived, when I arrived here is, was to make sure that uh, my family was okay. And then you start doing things that will facilitate family reunification. And then you start to do things to join community effort here that will support Liberia. So that is how we found ourselves in the, uh, the Liberian community uh, uh, organization. And then we realized that it is not only us that were coming, but there was an inflow of a lot of Liberians. Our elders were also coming. The young people were also coming. Uh, women were coming. Children were coming. So then the demand for community services start getting larger mm -hmm. and larger. So then we decided to be part of community service, you know, to provide these uh, services, help to provide these services for our people here, while at the same time advocate for better conditions at home. So then I begin the journey from community to uh, so Eula leadership, uh, speaking on some of these things that we're talking about, uh, called war crime code, economic crime code. These were things that, you know, we continue to call for them at the time. Okay. 
so how are you able to get your family over? Well, at the time I came, two of my kids were in refugee camp, one in Ghana and the other one in, uh, in the Ivory Coast. Uh, so after you meet the, the, the necessary legal status here, yeah, you know, then of course the immigration thing, you make the petition and then that's how I came. That's how I became. And so um, once your children came, were there any services offered for them to deal with what they had left behind, deal with some of what they saw? When my children came, I was their, I was their chief service provider. Mm -hmm. I led the effort to personally reintegrate them into, into the society here. Mm -hmm. And then I also rely on my church. You know, church is good. You know, the church is good. So, of course, you the, the parent, you take personal responsibility, but then you create additional uh, social avenues that will help, you know, to integrate, that will help to deal with some of the issues you're talking about. Uh, on, the, on the community level, uh, there were areas we set up, you know, for basic transition, uh, that involved even giving people cultural awareness. Things that are culturally appropriate in Liberia may not be culturally appropriate here. Mm -hmm. you know, so those were some of the, the 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 direction it took at the community level, helping people to even fill up applications, giving job information, uh, CV preparation. You know, those were, you know, that was the community side. But as far as my own children were concerned, I was their chief, chief, uh, chief integrator. Me and my, my wife and, you know, a strong network of families that were around us. What were um, possibly some signs you saw from your children that they had experienced that trauma of the war? Um, I'll give you an example. One of my cousins, when they came to America from the war, uh, they were given a meal to eat, you know, that day. And he drew a line on his plate and he put, you know, one half of food on one side and then he ate one half. And so his mom was confused because she was on this side when things transpired. And she said, why, why, you, you know, put half of your food to the side and he said, you know, he was saving it for later, you know, because he wasn't sure if we would have food later. Did you see those kind of things um, with your children when they first came? No. no, when they first came, one of the things I, I saw, I don't know what I was, I don't know what I was at, at because of the war or because of being in a new environment. Uh, there was that, there was that hesitancy. I noticed that hesitancy on their part, mm. uh, and that self-questioning, you know, as to whether they belong, you know, whether even if they had to be school, whether they belong, and you know, always questioning, you know, themselves as to whether they belong to this place, they belong to that place. So for me, it was more of the self-questioning. It was the, the, the hesitancy that we had to break, you know, and then uh, because with that kind of attitude, you find out that the children do not live up to their full potential. Mm -hmm. So you got to break that quickly, you know. Uh, then, of course, coming from Liberia, one of the biggest things the children need here is the bullying, the bullying that is in the schools, mm -hmm. not, not, not even by their white peers, but by their very African-American peers, you know? So that was a big thing, you know? So for me, it was a hesitation and then the self-questioning uh, as to, you know, what, what would be their place, what role, you know, their role questioning themselves. And then you, you got to get to the bottom of it to build them up and, you know, remove that hesitancy and remove that fear of belonging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing the Liberian Civil War, survivors sharing their story. 
And um, you are welcome to join the discussion by sharing your own story by asking a question or giving a comment. The number to call is 706-684-0392. And uh, since we are telling our stories, uh, my co-host Danielle was born and raised here in the US uh, with <laughs> Liberian parents. Danielle, I just want you to uh, tell our audience, the uh, viewers, and even tell uh, our guest, Mr. Cooney, what was your experience like hearing these stories and maybe asking your parents questions and talking about Liberia, what was happening? What was it like? Mm. Well, so I was born in 1987. Um, and so I guess 1989, 1990, I'm three years old. Um, I guess my understanding that there was a war or something was going on where my parents were from. Um, by that time, my grandmother and some of my cousins were in a refugee camp. Um, I remember us being able to communicate on the phone sometimes. Um, whenever that happened, whatever hour it was, it's like the whole house woke up. Um, I remember just trying to say hello to my grandmother. Um, I remember, because I grew up in New York City, and I, my aunt, I call her the Moses. It was like she was the one who brought everybody over. So for most of my family, their first um, arrival in America was at JFK and we would go to get them and uh, they would come to my aunt's house and have that first big meal. Um, that's how I, I met a lot of my family and um, you just kind of saw this relief, you know, like, oh, we're finally here. But then there was also a little bit of worry because they left somebody behind, um, whether it be, you know, a spouse or a child. So it's happy to be here, but also just a, a concern for whoever you left behind. So I remember that. Um, and, and more than anything, I guess I remember the late, just the late night phone calls um, on my mom's side. She would be able to get in touch with her family um, or Really, they got in touch with us, uh, you know, and sending money. Um, like I said, every time those phone calls came in the early wee hours of the morning, it was like <laughs> the whole house woke up. So, the, I mean, those are just the little bits and pieces I remember. Um, and then by the time my grandmother came over, I remember she was a, a prayer warrior. And um, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my grandmother would be on her knees praying. And I would hear her praying for all of her relatives she left behind by name, um, asking for God, you know, God for mercy, asking for peace in her country. Um, those are the things that I guess stick out to me in, in my memory most. Um, yeah, especially I guess during the early 90s period. So, so, Mr. Cooney, there were a lot of massacres in Monrovia, and uh, we published a list of them, I mean, in Liberia. Uh, there is a 1998 massacre in Grand Cru. There is Lutheran Church. There is Kato Kiam. There is Bakedu. There is uh, the Kalfiu or Dupo Row. There is one in Yamesno, Nimba County. There is one in Ganta, and all over the place there were massacres. There were even massacre in my hometown. Being in Monrovia, how was the, the news of all these massacres received? And being in a, someone with security training, being a security officer, what was it like in your mind as to why these things were happening, who did it, and uh, whether they were ever going to be brought to justice? Well, uh, Dennis, to be honest with you, uh, indeed there were there were a lot of massacres that took place during the Liberian Civil War, but uh, specifically, there are two massacres I can I can give general information about uh, the Duporo and the Karakim. And there is no doubt in my mind, all the evidence suggests that those, those two massacres were conducted by the MPFL. Uh, even though after the, the Karakim massacre, there was this investigation uh, that, that, that placed the blame on the AFL, but uh, that that investigation is completely in, inaccurate from all of the uh, all of the evidence, 
all of the sources uh, that, that, were, that were interviewed, it was impossible for the AFL to have committed that, that massacre. But uh, the international community at the time, uh, for whatever purpose, uh, thought that it was the AFL. And from my personal knowledge, at that time in uh, national security, it was not possible for the AFL to have committed that act. Uh, the Dupo role, again, is, it was part of the MPFL strategy to instill fear and terror in the, in the, civilians, uh, in the civilian population. Uh, to make the areas ungovernable. As for the other massacres you talk about, were those where they were outside of Monrovia, I don't, besides indirect information and knowledge about them. Uh, but for Dupolo and for Karakem, those were the direct action, direct action of the National Patriotic Front of, of Mr. Charles Taylor. And some of those who committed uh, those atrocities, some of them are. Uh, some of them are still walking around in Liberia. Uh, some are alive uh, in neighboring African countries. Uh, so uh, those tragedies, those tragedies, uh, uh, I think their purpose was to, to, to terrorize the population and uh, to, 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 to seek power at all costs. You know, those were the basis for that. And uh, But the other point I wanted to make, uh, talking about victims, uh, I mean, given the, the, the general fact that the war was fought along ethnic lines, like, say, uh, Gio and Gran, Gran Mandingo, normally when we talk about the war, we, we tend to see victims uh, from, from, from the, those tribal groups because those were the, the dominant tribe that fought the war. These were the people that fought against one another. But as you've, as you've discovered, uh, victims of the war cut across the entire population. There were people that were victims of the war simply because they were doing their duties as civil servants of government, you know, simply because they were doing their duties to country. You know, journalists were victims of the war simply because they were doing their professional duties. So I'm happy that you've brought in the whole concept of, 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 of this uh, victim narrative, because most times uh, it, it tends to be defined by the tribal component of the war, you know, and that sometimes tends to mislead uh, in a direction that it is only uh, uh, people that were of certain tribal background that were affected. Yes, indeed, they, they were the most affected. But at the same time, there were people who were not in our category, but in other category of life in Liberia, like me, like other people that were severely, severely affected by this war. And I'm happy that you're reaching out, you know, so that everyone can bring out, bring out their story, whether they are Gil, whether they are Mano, whether they are Matingo, whether they are Kran, you know, but any Liberian, you know, that got impacted by this war you know, so that uh, they can bring out their story. I think this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful uh, uh, act on, on your part. And I must commend you and your staff. Thanks, Mr. Kumi. Um, Dennis, do you have a caller there? Yes, we have a caller on the line. Call out your name and where you're calling from. Yeah, um, my name is Ian Gavney. I join you from South Dakota this afternoon, my time here in the U.S. Uh, I want to appreciate you, your co-host, and your guests this evening for this elaborate discussion. I see it's fulfilled. Uh, I'm a kid in Oman, 1992, in Liberia, but I also have to, to have a tip of the, the Civil War, reaching from 2000, uh, 2000 to 2003, that was World War II, World War III, before Trump uh, was being arrested and taken to Nigeria. I have a bit of experience of the war. Uh, I experienced how the war was and how critical it was and the level of, of brutality and the pain that people went through. Uh, having said that, the, the, the brutality that people went through was very, 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 very unacceptable, especially when it comes to human rights, right? People being raped, people being tortured, 
for of all the vulnerable circumstances for no reason. I remember uh, my my mother saying to me that hey, young man, you cannot go to school because you have war in the country and you will have to sit down for a while. We have nowhere to go. With that ring here in real life, with that, we have nowhere to go. I tired the road. She said, I tired to run with you. She said, I, I was running with you since uh, 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 1989. I, I stopped running with you. I was running, running until I'm tired of running. It's too enough for me to run now. She said, I push it to me, sir. I can't run again. I said, Ah, yeah, what would do now? She said, Would you have to see? I remember us eating corn cabbage. Yeah, uh, eating the 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 the, the palm butter with kiss meat. Many days, uh, no food. Remember, three for uh, 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 eight family house eating three calories to survive. I mean, it's not easy. So, uh, it's basically a condition of how much of people who experience to work in the Genesis or to that time of 2003, mm. until, um, until it went down. How, how peaceful it was. I, I, I was just a little kid, which is the first a little kid of my parents telling me how to suffer to keep, to keep me to make sure. In the very that I lost my little brother. Mm. Yeah, I lost a little brother. In the process, he felt sick. There was no way. Mm. No medication. Nothing could happen. Uh, he has to go. Mm. I mean, so that I so I see the wind. That wind still impels my mind. Whenever I get that red light, I go around that place. That psychological emotion feelings impels my mind every mm. time. Every time of how I lost my little brother mm. at that place because of the civil war. Then in our country like Peru, we have people who are saying that. We must practice safety justice. We must be able to let the back home be back home. It's that puts my heart that we have these people in leadership and we have our own citizens, our own people go to the table and you trust the people of our country and say mm -hmm. to them that you are a leader. We sing the song, we sing the nice person. It pisses my heart in keeping my hope mm -hmm. of our country like period. So uh, uh, I don't know who we tell it. The moment that we can solve our problem like that is that we need to continue to the basis of the rules that have been, have been built, mm. right? We need to break it. And if we cannot break it, the country will not move forward. Mm. The issue of the war crime group is a necessity to Liberia. Those that have committed atrocity against our people must be held responsible. Let them come. And uh, they exonerate themselves from what of I don't care what you are a pastor from church or whatever it is from your national leader. If you're part of the matter here, the press Liberia must know that uh, this is a national call, this is a national emergency, this is an international issue, this is something over 250,000 life, right? This is about estimated, right? So we have more than that life that was, that was being or, 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 or killed. And we have no reasons, right? And, and then he sit there and tell us that Walker Cook is left to justice and somebody said, oh, we're backing because he's backing us, we support him, he support us. They say, that's what uh, uh, the country will move forward. I say no. But I say thank you to our father there who was able to improve his circumstances. God being God, first being God, he fought it to manage to see that his family come this way. I mean, I know he do have challenges. Every one of us in like, well, who would other it I say to people that my mm -hmm. generation cannot fight the war, but my generation particularly the war, indirectly my generation, right? Because uh uh, if a great phrase of people saying the war is not that like you hold arms and go mm. and fought war, right? Mm. You know, in the in the context of my scene, I always say that we say my generation fought the war is that we struggle, right, to run through all the bullets and the information to save us. And there are many that time we and uh, people during the war, so civilians try to defend themselves, right? Mm. But Thank there was you. no way. Right. There was no way. So, what, uh, what's your name again? My, my, my name is Bill, and I want to say thank you for your show. I always follow your show. You're very objective into the issues. Hope that you can continue on that path. I mean, you will have a lot of audience that will follow your, your program. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you for the courage in sharing your story. This is the only yeah. way that we can bring healing. This is the only way the country can move forward because we cannot go on operating a, a dysfunctional country where people need to be rehabilitated. The wounds are not yet being healed 
and we think that we can make it. It's just not possible. Thank you again for calling. All right. Um, Dennis, can I turn the yeah. on you for a minute and ask you some questions? Oh, sure. Okay, so I, I know I've, I have read some of your older blog posts where you explain a couple of your stories. Um, can you just tell us about, you know, where you were when things started and some of your stories along your journey to this point today? Uh, th thank you. And uh, I tried to put some out there. It was in 1989 that I, uh, the war started. In 1989, I've just, uh, in 1988 first, I have just graduated from Moravia College High School and entered the university. So everything about me was just school, 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 school. I had uh, in my book a plan of how many credits, you know, you can take first semester. So by 1992, I had everything planned out that by this time, I'm going to be this place, I'm going to be this, that place. But that was not the case. In 1990, uh, we had my family or my my parents were in Sino County where I was born in a little town called Dudwicken. And uh, we've moved to Monrovia living with my sisters and going to school. So when the war hit, we had other families in uh, Yekipa. Everybody has come to Monrovia. Everybody has come to Monrovia to join us there. We're in Bannersville at that time. And that's like the um, suburb of Monrovia. Mm -hmm. So things were very difficult. So just a short version of my story was a uh, in 1990, when the war hit, uh, especially uh, on, in August, we have visited Pinsville to go to our uncle's house to get some food. And that was our first encounter with rebels. They were trying to kill everybody. The impression we got before the rebels came was they were going to uh, quote unquote, remove dough from our backs. And a lot of us embraced the idea that indeed we were suffering, we were in dictatorship and we need, and, uh, the president needed to go. That was not the case. When the, when the uh, war came, they were looking for you know, ethnic groups to exterminate. So my ethnic group, being a, uh, a gravel person from Sino County, that was not known. So the rebels, when you told anyone that you were gravel from Sino County, they didn't believe you. That was automatic death. So we have to say we were cruel. Why we did that? Because we got a, a prior notice from one of uh, a, a relative who was captured at Coca-Cola factory when the rebels entered Monrovia. He told us that they were killing not just crown people that they were killing, they were also killing crew people, gravel people, anybody just related to crown. On the other side, because their two prime uh, targets were crown and Mandingo and government soldiers. That's what we heard. But for Mandingo, they couldn't really determine who a Mandingo person is. So anyone who was you know, maybe of the Muslim faith was targeted. So ethnic groups like Vi or other groups that were closer to the Mandingo ethnic group, they were all targeted. So 1990, my family were 21 person in, in number. We walked from Monrovia to Cotton Tree. That took us days before getting on a truck to go to Bikena. And from Bikena, we went to Yekepa. The truck that took us, or the train that took us to Yekepa, Sam Doki, a big NPFL commander at that time was on that train. Because my sister had lived in Yekipa for since the early 70s, so she was known there. So we went to Yekipa and later on crossed the border to Guinea in Bosu. We stayed in Bosu and uh, uh, being a college student at that time, we were fortunate to start teaching. But when, uh, when we learned that things were subsiding in Monrovia, we went back to Monrovia 91. Then we got caught in the war again, 1992. Mm -hmm. And this time we had to walk from Monrovia to Grand Bassa County, a place called LAC or LAC. And when I say walk, this took days. And if you go on my blog, you could see step by step my experience. It was horrible. Passing thousands and thousands of checkpoints where at each checkpoint, your life is being threatened. You see people being killed. You see girls and women being raped and all that. So that was 92. We, again, by the grace of God, we crossed over to Yekipa and then to Guinea. Then came after 92, 93, then we found out again that uh, things were okay. 
because everything about me and my sibling was all school. We go back to complete University of Liberia. So we went back to Moravia again, and then another war was started called April 6, 19, uh, the Blood Naked War. Again, this time, we first tried to go on a ship. We we're on a ship called Zolotisa. This ship, we paid our money and got on the ship, but it was declared not seaworthy. So after a week or two at the Freeport, we had to disembark on that ship, left our money and came home. That ship still left the port, a cycle around West Africa and went back. People died, people were murdered and the rest of it. But this time we decided to go by Rome. We got in the car of rebels who we paid some money to take us to the border. Again, we had to cross checkpoint and at each of those checkpoints, our lives were threatened. We were nearly conscripted but I remember when uh, my brothers and I, were, my two brothers and I, when we got to uh, 15 gate, they put us in jail, not just in the jail, put us in a container, ready to be executed. They continue, me, what they continue putting you in a container was the place of no return. I mean, your death was just sure, signed, sealed. So we were there. Why? Because they saw my brother university ID card that said UL. They explained, according to them, in their wisdom, UL meant you limbo. So they put us in the container to be executed. We went in the container and, uh, you know, when you are facing death, you are very close to God. So my brother first was put in the container, so that my oldest brother, Dave. So when Dave got in the container, we we're all, you know, just in our underpants. So we were there, and then Dave said, when we got to the door, we started to beg the guy, say, let's bring me in the, in the cell instead of going further in the container. And this container is like a tank or, or, or tank that carried gas. There were some bullet holes at the bottom so you could see little light coming through. The container was inclined on the window, so we were in the container. We put us in the container. Right there, we started to sing gospel song and started, I mean, Everything was lost. The only thing we're doing now, preparing our souls to be received by God. In that process, they were, there was bitter argument going on outside. Whether they should kill us, whatever they should do, they argue and argue and they almost fought. During that time too, there was another rebel who saw us in Bannersville. This rebel now told them that we were good people, we, did, we didn't need to be killed. So he was begging them. He didn't know her that much, but for some reason, he was just like an angel that God has provided to beg on our behalf. So why in the jail, the guys then came? Because before they finally kill you, they cut off your ears and everything. So since we have resigned that we're going to die, he came and said, come, let me cut your ears off. So we politely walked to him and put our head before him for him to perform the operation. He told us, <laughs> hush well. He put us back in the jail and just locked the container and went back to argue. Long story short, we were released. So when we were released, we decided not to go further. So if you cross 15 gate to Kakata, you're going to be killed. So we managed, we stay in that, this was around Octopus. So we stay in that area for a couple of months before making our way to Yekepa again, and then to Guinea. In Guinea, we were teaching the refugee school, but at this time, Ulimo was formed. So every year, the Ulimbo forces will walk side by side with the Guinean army to go to the borders. So people that were of the, uh, that came from Nimba, they were suspected of being rebels. It was during one of those times that in my class, one of my students was, they came and they wanted him because they said his brother who was captured from the NPFL met him in Zerikoli in a place called Zerikoli in Guinea. And because they couldn't find this little boy in mean, my student had to, something to do with it. So they came and surrounded us in the classroom. The Guinean soldiers and the Ulimo forces wanted the boy. And he escaped and went to the principal office. For the, for the rest of the day, I couldn't teach because this thing was going on. These things were very, very horrible. 2000, uh, so as a result of the war, as my siblings and I, we sought refuge in Guinea three times, in Ivory Coast, in Nigeria, and then Ghana before I finally came to the States on the uh, resettlement program or the refugee program. 
even when I arrived in the state, I was traumatized. It took me over 10 years when I'm going through a tow boot. I was afraid I couldn't even go through a tow boot because I have crossed so many checkpoints. I've been in jail by rebels so many times. I have been, you know, almost conscripted. Rebels were forced us to carry their loot. When they looted, they took us and we should carry the loot. And while you are carrying their loot, the echo monk soldiers think that you are a rebel because you are a young boy. So they begin to fire at you from the air, from the sea, and everywhere. It was just by the grace of God that we made it. And the trauma continued for very, very long time. And because of the war, there was uh, a lot of, because of the ethnic groups that participated mainly in the war, there was a whole lot of animosity towards them, especially those of us that crossed through the NPFL lines. The sound of the languages spoken in Nimba, Mano or Gyo, they were so traumatizing that it took me years. If I heard someone speak Mano, I was terrified. When I heard someone speak or Gyo or Dan, I was terrified. But it takes, you know, the sad part is none of us got any treatment, not rehabilitated. Things just went away by on their own. And because those of us that uh, maybe believe in God, we decided to pray so that God himself give us the comfort to be able to live day by day. But the trauma of the war still exists. And I can see sometimes, you know, some of the things that I have, because of that, I just hate war. No matter it could be the war, the best war ever, I still don't like it. You could have all the best reasons to wage war. I still don't support war. And I hate war with all my five senses. That, that's just a short version of my of the horror we went through. Oh, but Adonis, but, but, I remember I remember a story specifically around a Christmas day or something during your your time in Liberia during the war time. Can you tell that story? That's a that's a long story. In uh, when we crossed that 15 gate and get in a place called Kingsville. Things were hard. So in the day we go, my two brothers and I would go in the bush to find food. And at, at night we come home with whatever, it could be palm nun, palm cabbage. We set traps. We did everything anyone in the interior could do. And then we had a friend who was, uh, we grew up together in our hometown. Now he was commanding a rebel force or a, a group called the Cobra. He operated the GMG, but most of the time he was under the influence of drugs. So we couldn't really talk as friends. So one day, I mean, when he was, when he is sober, he comes and we just talk about childhood stories. So it was on Christmas day that he was inviting us to his home or to his checkpoint so that we could have a meal we could eat because finding food was just difficult. But by the time we got there, you know, the rebels, all the more rebels were there, and so they ate the food. And uh, we, we got there, and he, when we got there, he said, oh, who ate their food? I'm going to fire if crack is gone, that he was going to shoot at them. But then he just gave us the little that was left in his plate. Why taking this? Because we're in battle, we're ashamed, you know. It's everything about you, your pride is all gone. So I tried to take the food from the room and carry it in a secluded place to eat. But on the way, I stumped my toe and the food fell. It wasted. So I called that, and it, this was on Christmas Day. So I called it the Merry Christmas. It was not merry, it was like Christmas in the mud. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm sure that was a horrible <laughs> feeling. You already <laughs> home, and then you drop the food. Mm. I did. But a, another thing happened in that that I will never forget. Mm -hmm. they, uh, where, where there was a there was a, a man was selling banana, right? So a rebel came and, and bought banana he was eating. So he peeled the banana, but because it was long when he bit it, he cut a piece of it, dropped on the floor in the sand. Mm -hmm. I was only saying my 23rd Psalm so that that guy wouldn't step on the banana that fell in the sand so I could eat it when he left. Mm -hmm. So when he left, I pick up the banana because the more you try to clean it, there are more banana going off the place. So oh, I put wow. it in my mouth and try to sift the sand from it and eat it. After eating it, and I just had to spit out the sand. 
But after eating, at least I had something. Mm -hmm. But this piece of banana came from the mouth of a flesh eating rebel. Wow. Wow. But Daniel. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, I'm hearing yes. you. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful story, you know. I mean, beautiful in a way that we can all talk about it and laugh now. But like I said, mm -hmm. you know, when these things happening, at that time, you you know, the danger of it, you know. And so, uh, I mean, it's just by the grace of God that some of us are here today to to relay these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but just on a lighter side, even in that, environment of insecurity in that environment of death there were some funny things that happened that we still remember you know i remember we were traveling on the road to the checkpoint just like you said uh uh you know the war had the exit over tune and uh we got to one of the checkpoints and the the, the guy asked us for our tribe and we said we crew and the guy said oh all the crime people down there, they're changing their set to crew. So I had my grandmother, I had my grandmother, I was talking to my grandma, asked me in crew. Say, what did the man say? So I told my grandma, I said, oh, the man say, we lie you, we now crew with crime. Then the old man crossed the man in crew, or in and I said, yeah. I said, oh man, don't be crying. <laughs> I said, the thing where you talking, you're not talking here away, let's talk about them first. Mm -hmm. Then we crossed that checkpoint. We got to the other checkpoint. You know, my wife and the family, they, they grew, but they grew up in Monrovia. You know, the more you stay in Monrovia, especially even those of us that were, that were born in the interior, you come to Monrovia, the more you stay in Monrovia, the, the English dilute the language. Some of the words you could comfortably say in crew, you know, you mix them all with English. How much more about people who are already born in Monrovia. So my wife, Doku, they, they can't speak the language very well. So we got to the checkpoint and they, they asked my wife, they said, oh, you crew? Yeah, okay. Where they crewed me for boat? Where they crewed me for boat? So my wife there, you know, so I started sneaking around it. Brabway, brabway, you know, the brabway. The man said, no, no, the tear answer, you must tell her, the one that you crew, they crewed me for boat. And then, but, while she was struggling, you know, they couldn't get distracted because they're dealing with this thing. They had another thing happening, and then they were just straight there, and they would just wave us through. So, and then I started laughing out. I said, you see, the boo are coming to you because you can't even speak your own language. And then we started to go. Then mm -hmm. back in the village where we used to trade the palm nut for rice, they had one guy in the village, you know, it, we were not really rebel, but you know those guys that that, that friend with the rebel, you know, the friendly with the rebel there. So because of that, they're able to get things like rice, and you know, because of whatever favor they've been doing for the rebel. But this guy, very, very dirty. The clothes the men get. All the men's clothes, I mean, the labrador men say, tier, tier clothes. You go look for the rice, the men don't see no woman but my little sister-in-law that the woman you say you want. So you say, oh, Mr. Joe, you know, by that time, my name Joe now. Mm -hmm. You say, Mr. Joe, now your little sister there. I say, I want to get, but she's looking at the clothes. I keep telling her, don't look at the clothes on the man, but the man in the clothes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be laughing, you know, but the man there in the, the clothes, and the man there in the clothes, everything looks the same. So, <laughs> What? One day I want to go get rice. I want to buy the rice from him. Then he tells me, say, Mr. Joe, ever since I tell you, say, I want your sister. And your sister will come and smile with me. Small sir. They want to come here the way I will come and measure it. I will not come and sit down. I will just be, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but since your sister can smile with me, I will measure it. And then we'll be, I'm going, wow. <laughs> 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 I went. I was there, like, it, that your back. Yeah. I, I got a I got a question here for, for me. So I want to answer and include something that I left out in my story. 
Oh, uh, yeah. there's a question from Oscar asking me if I still afraid of Mana and Guillaume. Or uh, Oscar, the answer is no. I want to also mention that uh, when LPC forces went in Sino to my village, they, they, they burned the entire town. And most of the LPC people that were there, they were out of a crown ethnic group or the sapo that make up the bulk of the fighting force under Judge Bully. So they burned my town and killed a whole lot of old people in the town. One of those who they killed was my father. And up to today, he was only identified by his clothes. So they killed my father. They killed his, his sister, who's my aunt, or Betty. That's the one I named my first daughter after. Uh, and then they also killed Betty's first son, who was the teacher who established, or who was the principal for the school in my hometown from 1967 till the war. They killed him too. So because of that, I was also bitter against crown people. Because when the news got to us in Guinea that uh, LPC or crown people went in your town, burned the whole town of Dodwiken. The other the time, because Dodwiken, my hometown, has a mission. And this mission operated the biggest library, perhaps, in Sino County. So after the missionary left, this, the town was still good. In fact, it became the headquarters of the Mayan Statutory District. So they burned the whole entire town, killed a lot of people, including my dad. So because of that, I was bitter against crown people. And then because I have gone through the rebel lines controlled by those of the Mano and Gil ethnic group, I was also traumatized by that. So, but again, being a Christian, after some time, I got my own healing by the grace of God. And now my best friends are of the Mano and Gil tribe. And in fact, my wife, the mother of my children for the past 20 years, is of the Crown ethnic group from Miba County. So I think uh, I represent you know, uh, that reconciliation or the healing that God himself can give to people that you can go across and don't remember anything anymore. So right now I am healed. And if those of you who follow my writing, see how much I was in the forefront of the of war crimes. Why I still support accountability in a war, but my own healing, because I was bitter, I wanted these people dead. I wanted them, so I was very angry. But the death of Roosevelt Johnson brought healing to me. It was like, God speaking to me that he has a way of dealing with the people that have caused me so much harm. I'm not imposing that on anyone. It was my own hour of reckoning and it was my own the thing that brought me peace. It may not bring peace to other people. And so I'm not as anxious about justice against those who perpetrated the crimes. I wanted them to tell me sorry, which they never did. And because of that, I was opposed to the candidacy of President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf because she did not recant her stance in the war, neither did she apologize. Because the person who died as a result of the war, that was my father, that was my aunt, six of my cousins, an innocent guy called Prince who was in law but became a relative. We all started our, our football team in Barnersville. Around Coca-Cola factory, when they first saw him, they just say, the Madigo man. He, they did not even give him a chance to even say a word. They started firing at him and they killed him. So these things were all bitter memories. I'm only giving a short version of all the pains we went through. Six cousins dead, father is dead, uh, aunt, uncles, and all these people, they were killed. In fact, when they met my cousin in the house, they said, oh, are you, I mean, and they did all these horrible things. So it takes your own peace in your heart to bring that comfort that no man gave. So, I mean, somebody said, well, why don't you, why don't you like it? How can I, 10 years of my life, because by 1988, I was 17 years old and graduated from high school. Went to university with my life on a piece of paper that by 92, I was going to uh, graduate from the University of Liberia, go and, and study power engineer, something I, I <laughs> engineering on the master level return and all that and all those shadows. And for the next 10 years, we were just sitting down from one refugee camp. I was on a, a refugee camp in Guinea. I was on a refugee camp in Africa. 
in 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 uh, the Oro camp in Nigeria, and then finally in in Ghana with all these. So your entire life is ravaged and shattered. Coming to the, uni the United States 2000 before going back to community college. So it's like 10 years taken away from your life. I was bitter, but thank God for the peace that he has brought in my life. There's a caller on the line. Call your name and where you're calling from. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Jimmy, Jimmy Eastman. How are you? Hi, Jimmy. Your question or comment and welcome to Focus on Liberia. Well, um, thanks, thanks for the show. Um, so one of the things about healing is even being able to discuss these things. And um, so I think it's a, the program is a step in the right direction. But um, we do need to um, address the, the trauma that Liberians went through. Now, there's, there's several ways to address it. Um, War Crimes Code is one of them, but um, there's a lot of the, the psychological scars that remain uh, from what we experience. A court may not be the only way to address it, and uh, and that is and that is where I differ from many advocates of the War Crimes Code. It's not that I do not think we need to bring um, uh, people to retribution. But is that what we really need? If that is the only way to address our, 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 our psychological issues that we experience today, our social, socio-psychological issues, um, um, there are some things that happened due to war were due to tribalistic uh, tendencies. Like you see, this man, I'm a thing, man, let kill you. This man, I'm a model man, let's kill him. We saw that. But to my utter surprise today, I still hear echoes of tribalism being chanted at high heights. Mm -hmm. It's never been in our advantage to target any group or paint anybody with a broad brush. It is always, you look at a person's character, who they are, before you uh, uh, um, determine how you want to uh, engage them. But so long as we still touting the tribalistic uh, uh, definition of people and view them with with with, um, with lenses that are unfair and biased, we'll, we'll repeat some of the problems. But I believe that yes, if we have enough evidence, because evidence gathering evidence or uh, setting up a court is a very technical issue. It first involves it's going to involve a lot of logistics. There are some organizations that may support us. But is that the only thing we need to address before we right the wrongs or we begin to address the trauma that we've experienced? I think there are programs that we need to gear toward just for radio, media, that help heal people, like what you're doing right here today, that you're able to discuss issues that affected you in your family, you know, and an apology can a lot of times go a long way. And maybe if we give others a chance to apologize, we may see a lot. But I've always seen that the, a courtroom is not the sole way we will repair the damage that we've experienced. All of us been through camps refugee camps. Uh, some of us saw it before 1990, or some of us saw it in 1980. <laughs> we saw the same thing, but yeah. we can we can still pull it together yeah. and survive. Okay. We need to have the right remedy. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Th thank you so much. We, we have some comments on Facebook, and I will read one from uh, a therapist. Uh, one of the things is this is uh, Dave Ja. He said it takes courage to share a story of trauma and despair. Importantly, there is where healing begins. We all need to be constantly reminded that war, violence, or extreme hardship can have far-reaching impact on individual psychological and physical well-being. Disorders such as depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder are associated with violence and war. 
There is also evidence that adverse life experiences are associated with diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and even cancer. This should teach us that the more chaos we make in our society, the more we negatively impact people, even if they do not directly experience the violence. Mr. Mr. Kooning, there's a question from uh, Oscar Bless you. He said, you remember the other massacre, but you couldn't remember the, or account for the Lutheran Church massacre. That is disappointing. Well, to that point, uh, you, I think you have to, you have to be very, uh, you have, you have to pay careful attention to timeline. As I explained in my presentation, my own journey for survival started in June of 1990. I believe the Lutheran massacre took place after that. So I was not even in Monrovia when that massacre took, took place. I remember it, I heard about it. And like I said, there were other massacres that I heard about. But the two that I spoke about, those were the two massacres I had reasonable information uh, about the, the Duporo and uh, the Kara camp. But with regard to the blue tray and the rest that you mentioned, uh, those were massacres I heard about. But I was not around when it, when it took place. So uh, I think the point I was trying to make was, you know, you asked where my location during those massacres. For Duporu, I was in Monrovia. For Karakam, I was in Monrovia. Uh, and I was in a reasonable position to know uh, who the perpetrators may have been. Or uh, the Lutheran massacre, I was already, I was all, I was already on the run out of Monrovia, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is why, but it, 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 that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened. Uh, there are credible stories to the Lutheran massacre, and again, like we all say here, all those, if the evidence uh, point to individuals that, that, that perpetrated these uh, uh, horrors, you know, they should be held accountable. Thank you. And Oscar too, he, he shared his own experience. He said that because from 1985 to 1990, uh, the government forces, the government troops in Monrovia were targeting Manu and Gio. And he's been one of those, he had to change his name from C to Oscar. So even to this day, I know him as Oscar. I didn't know he was even C. You see, so here, here now we have like similar experience, except that Immediately when I got to Monrovia, I dropped the journey to my name because I couldn't sustain the journey any longer. Charles and Harrieta Boakai say no country on earth can survive without fully implementing the rule of law, especially with the cause of Liberia, the war and economic crime court is a key in moving forward. Stop this disbelief and make Liberia a lawful country. This is not the time. We don't have the money. We are so, so friendly. I think it's all games to continue living a deplorable and depleted world. Rule of law is a way forward. Ms. Uh, Menen say, I'm glad we are having this conversation. And this is our, uh, the musical, the artist, Ms. Menen. Menen. He said, I'm glad we are having this conversation because there are so many people who have unknown problems because of the war. Some of us were able to go through self-healing, but there are so many we don't talk about, who don't talk about their experiences. And Mr. Coney, I believe, uh, what are some, and Daniel too, you can join, what are some of the signs you see in Liberia that are point to the fact of what uh, Ms. Mene is talking about, that there are still scars of the war that we carry I spoke with a, with a psychologist or a therapist who said, even in the United States, when librarians go to a party, they still pack food to carry because you still have that mindset that <laughs> you don't want to find food tomorrow. So you got to pack whatever food you have. What are some of the things you see happening in Liberia that point to the fact that healing has not really taken place? Yeah. Uh, well, uh... The, some of the things you see in Liberia that, that tell you that, that healing has not taken place, I mean, on a political level, uh, and which others have alluded to is the fact that you still have in Liberia 
uh, to some extent, our body politics being detected by people who had direct involvement in the war, people that amassed illegal wealth during the war are now at the center of politics in our country, making decisions for our people. So uh, these things still, still present the symbols of the war in, in, in Liberia. Uh, it, it still presents a situation where uh, there is no real departure from the war. Then more so, even in the language of the, of, of the people, you know, the, the bellicose languages that we use, even in civil discussion, you know, you find that, you know, a, a prevalent in Monrovia, the way we discuss issues, the way we present issues, you know, the kind of zero-sum uh, 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 proposition we carry to everything, you know. Uh, the, the unprecedented violence and criminality that is now in Liberia, that, those are scars of the war. I was in law enforcement before the war, and I see what is obtaining in Liberia today. Before the war, it was unlikely. It was really unlikely for a police officer to even fire a gun, you know, in Liberia, because then, then, I mean, it was also known that criminals were not armed, you know, so the need for you to even discharge your service weapon was something that, that was of a rarity. But now our criminals are even more dangerous than what they were before the war. They have the formation of, of, of armed gangs, you know, and, and then you go around, you know, people, the kind of names that people, uh, people, individuals gave to themselves, you know, Zoko or Zoko Association, you know, I think, I think this is a foul. We have to, like, I was reading something, Zoko Association and people, I know, drug transformation, you know, all these groups that are forming. And, Yes, Liberia was poor before the war. But look at what is happening in Monrovia. Where right now, the graveyard has now become, you know, a place where people live. You know you're from Monrovia. I'm from Monrovia. You know, that graveyard, people used to be very scared to even walk past the graveyard at night. But the graveyard is now home to people. Right. That tells you the war is still around in Monrovia. The war is still around. And I agree with the previous caller, yes. The war crime code is good. Nobody is saying that people should go free. But let us look at other things that would make Liberia normal again. You know, it can't just be, you know, the, the solution to, 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 to the problem, the country is it's not just good. It's more than that. The society is going through a lot. I could never imagine in my lifetime that somebody would go sleep in a graveyard and make it a home. And all those things are things that we, we come from during the war. And they, and they, then, smoke, uh, they, smoke, the boom. they smoke the boom of the person as a drug. Yeah, break, people, breaking, people breaking into caskets. So, I mean, like I say again, I'm speaking as someone who was in law enforcement. I never investigated a case, you know, the 14 years that I stayed in law enforcement before the war. I never investigated a case where people go and broke into... Uh, a, a cemetery and take the belongings of the dead body. So the level of criminality has taken on this warlike uh, uh, mindset. So these are the things you see in Liberia about that are still around that make you feel that the war is still around. On the question of like mm -hmm. here, people, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they're, they're, and our time is our fast spend. We wanted them now, so let me squeeze in. Few questions on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Solomon Mane Moen say, Hi, Mr. Kuni, and thanks for your leadership at Eula. Over the years, Liberians in the diaspora were noted for instigating political awakenings and destabilization in Liberia. But your leadership took a different turn in constructive engagement. What is your advice to Liberians in the diaspora as it relates to their country? Well, my advice is that. Again, we should continue to to, to constructively engage uh, with 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 our people, with the government. We should not shy away to praise the government when the government is doing what is right. Equally, we should not shy away to condemn the government if the government is not doing what is right. But again, we have to look at the changes that have taken place over the years. 
Yes, EULA used to be a, a protest organization, but now the new the new environment, like what my friends and uh, sometimes say the word I hate to use, the new trajectory is that people are engaging. We have to engage government, we have to engage the political leadership, and we we have to put our put forward our our ideas as to as to what will what will benefit our people. We should stop all these zero-sum games. It's either my way or your highway or, or your way. You know, and we should learn to dialogue. Because all of these reflections we, we're reflecting on today, you know, we would not have to do them maybe 10 15, and 15 years from now if we dialogue and solve our problem. And I think that's the spirit. That even, even outside of EULA leadership, this is what we're trying to encourage. Because Liberia is the only country all of us have. The people in Liberia say Liberia is the only country they can be deported from. Those of all that are here, Liberia is the only country that we can be deported to. So we have to be aware of that and, and try to make our country better, irrespective of uh, who is in power or who is not in power. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I think we can... Uh... Conclude, let me hear from you. Okay. Um, well, before I conclude, uh, Mr. Cooney, uh, do you have any other final thoughts on the war and its effects? And do you have any message for our people and other survivors? Uh, the, the, the short message I have for our people is that Liberians went to war because of the same issues that have always confronted that country, inequality, injustices, and everything. That's what took us to war. These issues still exist to some extent, but my appeal to my fellow librarians is now, let us resolve to, re to, to handle these issues in a peaceful environment. Let us try to improve our democracy. Let us try to hold our leaders accountable let us try to vote. Let us see voting and holding leaders accountable as the most viable option to resolving our national crisis other than leading, resorting to violence. Because violence, as I indicated, for each time we use violence to change leadership, instead of going forward, we go backward. So let us embrace the political process. Let us, let us agitate. After agitation, let us organize. After we organize, let us vote. After we vote, let us hold the leadership accountable. If they don't do what they're supposed to do, we organize again and we vote, we take them out. It is that, that kind of uh, uh, culture that will bring peace and stability to our country, that will enlist, it, enlist it investment, that will provide jobs, that will keep our country stable. So that is my plea to, to, to my fellow Liberians. A country that is constantly forming interim government is a failed country. And no serious person will take their, their investment in a country that is constantly. After every five years, you go to interim government. So let us embrace our democracy. We've made progress. Despite all of the noise, we've made progress. We have the right to celebrate ourselves uh, for the June 7. The organizers did well. The government did well. The protests went peaceful. You can contrast that to what happened next to Sierra Leone, where people were beating in their own kind of protest. So even in all of the noise, let's celebrate ourselves. And I think we Liberians, we are capable of improving our democracy. We are capable of governing ourselves. We are capable of keeping our country peaceful. Let us for one and forever say no to violence. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Cooney, and thanks for joining us today and being brave enough to tell your story and share it with our audience. Um, thanks to our audience for tuning in um, and listening and sharing in the experience. Uh, I guess my final thoughts for today, I am with Dennis and that I absolutely hate any form of war. Um, it's always puzzled me how someone can see another human human being and decide today is your last day on earth. Um, there are women who struggle to give birth, so we should know that giving birth is a gift. A human being is a gift 
So who are we to decide that it, it <laughs> who are we to decide someone's death date? You know, so I, I've never been able to wrap my head around it. Um, I've never never been able to wrap my head around the hate that fuels things like war and and tribalistic killings and genocides. Um, that being the case, I pray that there is never another war in Liberia again, and I pray for progress. Um, I hope that we can move forward. Um, and I hope inequality at some point can become a thing of the past that whether you're in office or whether you have a lot of money or you're poor or you're in the opposition party that you have an equal opportunity to advance in life. Um, I mean, these are the things that make people upset that push them to things like war. Um, but we just pray for a better Liberia and an eternally peaceful Liberia Kudos to, as um, Mr. Cooney said, the protesters, um, the police officers, law enforcement, and the government. Kudos to everyone in the country of Liberia for allowing the June 7th protests to occur and there be no casualties. Um, so that gives me hope for the future. Um, and so just long live Liberia and thanks for joining us. Please come back again. Uh, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. We're here every Sunday with the uh, focus on my area. Dennis? And uh, yes, next week, Sunday, we're going to be here. Our guest is Dr. Abdullah Dukla. He's going to be also sharing his uh, experiences in the war. He was one of those who participated in the peace conferences. He has a wealth of knowledge that he's going to be sharing and also his personal analysis on why we have the war and how can we avoid the recurrence of another war. War is ugly, war is so bad, and uh, there is should be no reason why we revert to war again because it will never fix anything. And I encourage all our political actors, both advocates, opponents, and proponents of the government to uh, use history as our guide. Always our history should be our guidepost so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. With that being said, we uh, also encourage all of us that uh, we should take efforts in teaching. There's no taboo to uh, hide what happened during the war. This needs to be taught. Slavery happened over 350 years ago. We're still talking about slavery. People are still asking for reparations. The transatlantic slave trade and all these things that happened, the, uh, the genocide, uh, the Holocaust, and all these things are still being thought about. Why can't we talk about the Liberian Civil War? Why can't we teach it so that our children know exactly what happened and how we can avoid a recurrence of such an ugly past? This is our own way from focus on Liberia to uh, remind ourselves about what happened, to write our own history and encourage all of us that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. On behalf of our guest relations manager, Stephanie Cetro, my co-host, Danielle, and all of those who support us, we say thank you so much for joining. Mr. Kuni, thank you once again for joining us. We want to say good night and God bless you. Thank you. Tell you to taste the rain water come down from the dark African sky in July. Tell you to taste the dust on the country road thick with the scent of palm kernels from a passing truck. Unless you smell that special scent of a burning farm, that special scent of sun dried leaves and bark and trunk and ashes in the evening while the ground is still hot. Unless you